Lord. Thank you so much. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. We'll begin our reading at verse 1. I invite you to keep your Bibles open. Keep your apps unlocked as we look at this word tonight. There are several verses that I want us to consider and review as we investigate the scriptures tonight. John chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. If you found it, say amen. If you don't, say wait for me. If you don't have it yet, say wait for me. Looks like we're all there, seems to be. All right, I'm reading tonight from the New International Version of the Holy Word of God, and this is what it says. Afterward, Jesus appeared to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. That's enough. Amen. Praise God for his holy word. You may be seated in the presence of our good and gracious God. I really wanted just that last line. It happened this way. Well, the time that is ours to share together tonight, I want to talk from the subject, what happened? What happened? What happened? We learned last night that the Lord Jesus Christ met some weary, frustrated, worn out, and fatigued disciples on the Sea of Galilee. We learned last night that he met these brothers who had been on the water all night long, fishing, doing what they had been trained to do, doing what they had become experts in doing. They had been on the water all night long fishing and the Bible says they caught nothing. Jesus showed up the next morning and although they were washing their nets as a sign of finality, as a sign of termination, he challenged these weary, worn, fatigued, and frustrated fishermen to go back out there and do it again. He showed them that when he gives the orders, that what he says will come to pass. And so we learned last night that Jesus challenged these disciples, stretched them to ignore past failures. Not simply to ignore past failures, but to initiate the possibilities of the future. And not simply to initiate the possibilities of the future, but likewise to ignite the power of their faith. Jesus told these disciples who would really become disciples to go back out there, do it again. And according to Simon Peter's testimony, he said, Jesus, Lord, we toiled all night long and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I let down the net. <laughs> And the Bible said they did what Jesus said do. They went back out there, let down the net, and they got so many fish that their net began to break. And when their net began to break, they had to call some of their friends. Were you all here last night? Y'all remember all this? Had they called their friends over and say, come on and help us get all these fish into the boat because Jesus has just given to us a net breaking blessing that can only take place when you do exactly what the Lord says do. <laughs> Jesus gave these disciples an awesome experience, an eye-popping, jaw-dropping experience that left them in the presence of God marveling, astonished at what he was able to do. But he did not stop there. We didn't read all the way to the end of the story, but if you keep reading to the end of the story in Luke chapter 5, which was our lesson last night, in Luke chapter 5, the Bible says that after they got all those fish in, Jesus looked at those weary, worn, frustrated, fatigued disciples and said, don't be all excited about this. Because from henceforth, I'm going to make you to become fishers of men. <laughs> he, he says, you're excited about the fish? That's good. But now I'm calling you to a greater level. 
Now I'm calling you to a greater experience. Now I'm calling you to a heightened understanding of what your assignment is for your life. And so now, in the first year of the ministry of the Lord Jesus, he calls these men from their fishing enterprise and says, follow me, and I'm going to make you to become fishers of men. Are we together tonight? You've got to watch the flow of the how this all falls apart, how this all comes together, because it begins with Jesus calling some weary, worn out, fatigued, and frustrated fishermen from the seashore on the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Tiberias. He calls them from that experience experience and he says although you just took in a whole lot of fish don't get excited about that because I'm shifting your assignment your assignment is now to follow me and I'm going to make you to become fishers of men and these jokers decided to follow Jesus can't you hear them singing the song I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back and they're on their way to follow Jesus and for three years they follow Jesus. For three years they watch him perform mighty miracles. For three years they listen to him preach powerful sermons. For three years they listen to him teach amazing lessons. For three years they are awestruck by the one who called them from their fishing enterprise and said I'm going to make you to become fishers of men if you follow me three years and then at the conclusion of the three years you know the story he died one Friday he died on, an, on a hill called Calvary and when he died they took him off that cross put him in the tomb he stayed there until early Sunday morning he rose with all power in his hand and the Bible says that on the evening of the day that he rose from the dead these same men were locked up in a room this is John chapter 20 they're locked up in a room by themselves and while they're locked up for fear of the Jews, afraid that the Jews are going to come and do to them what they had done to Jesus. Jesus shows up and when he shows up, he walks into that room without the benefit of them opening or unlocking the door and he simply says, peace be unto you. Oh, I love a Jesus like that who knows how to meet me right where I am and do exactly what needs to be done in my life. These shaken up brothers are now so nervous, they don't know how to continue fulfilling the assignment that God has placed on their lives and so Jesus shows up and says calm down don't be stressed don't be frustrated I've still got you in the palm of my hand I still know who you are and where you are and I still have an assignment for you I want you to go out and I want you to make sure that the entire world knows who I am he says I've got to leave now but I want you to continue the ministry that I started in your presence he says, now there are only 10 of you in the room tonight. And when those 10 were in the room, you know, Thomas was elsewhere. Don't know where Thomas was. He was supposed to be there, but he'd just gone on somewhere. And you know, uh, old Judas, he couldn't hang. So, I mean, well, he gone somewhere. And so... Y'all caught that, amen. Judas is gone, and so Judas is gone, and Thomas is gone, and the Bible says these 10 men are there. They see Jesus. The next week, Jesus shows up again, and because Thomas has said, I won't believe that he was here unless I see the nail print in his hand, unless I see the spear print in his side. So Jesus says, since you got to see everything before you believe it, Jesus showed back up the next week. He said, you said you wanted to see. I heard you. I wasn't here, but I heard you. I heard you wanted to see my nail print. Here they are. You want to see the spear print? Here it is. Listen, he said, don't doubt, just believe. Oh, that's a good word for somebody tonight. Somebody who's stressed out and you don't think that you're going to be able to make it to wherever God is trying to take you. You don't think the circumstances are going the way they should be going in your life. Jesus says, stop doubting, just believe. And so he gets Thomas on board, and now you've got 11 men. Now, 11 men who've been called by Jesus to follow him. They have got an assignment from Jesus to make more disciples. They have gone from being all messed up and stuck in a room, locked up by themselves, to being overjoyed that Jesus would show up. And then Thomas is overwhelmed by the fact that Jesus would show up again to give him a cameo appearance to see that he is the 
Jesus who is alive and well. Are you catching this? These brothers have been overwhelmed by the fact that Jesus is still alive and well. Thomas is overjoyed that Jesus would show up and make an, another opportunity for him to see who he is and what he's able to do. And by the time, that's chapter 20. And by the time chapter 20 comes to an end and you get into chapter 21, your Bible says in verse 1, afterward, we don't know how long it was, just a few days later, after that, after all that overwhelming, overjoyed experience, the Bible says in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 21 that Simon Peter decides, I'm going fishing. Now, now, please do not miss this because Simon has been called away from that duty, that responsibility. He's been given another assignment by the Lord Jesus Christ. But by the time we shift from the brothers being overjoyed and overwhelmed at the end of chapter 20, by the time we get to chapter 21, it seems like they're just over it. I'm over it. I don't feel like it because the Bible says that Peter didn't go by himself. There were six other brothers who went with him. Seven of the ten disciples who were remaining decided to go. Peter says, I'm going fishing. They said, well, I'm going to. You going? I'm going with you. And so they go from where the Lord has called them, from what the Lord has called them to do, from the assignment God has placed on their lives, and now they revert to what they were used to to what had been comfortable for them to what they were what they were accustomed to and i got to ask the question dr smith what happened between chapter 20 and chapter 21 to make seven brothers go from being overjoyed and overwhelmed to being over it because if you watch the text, child of God, these brothers who had spent three years in the ministry of Jesus, three years up close and personal with Jesus, three years following him everywhere he went. The Bible says he's given them an assignment to be fishers of men. And by the time we get to chapter 21 in the first few verses, we find out that these brothers have now been engaged in the resignation of their divine assignment. They said, I'm over it. I ain't doing this no more. I'm done. I don't feel like it anymore. How in the world can you be so happy 13 verses earlier? How can you be so excited? That was the six of them. How can you be so excited six verses earlier? That's Thomas. And now by the time you get to chapter 21, you saying, forget it. Throw it in the towel. Waving a white flag of surrender. Had such a good time at church last night, clapping and jumping and singing. And by the time lunchtime rolled around today, like, just forget it. I don't feel like it. Had such high hopes for coming back to worship on Tuesday night. But around six o'clock, that sleep demon got on you, and you were like, uh, I don't feel like it. I'm over it. Would you believe that there are some of us in this place tonight, although we may not want to admit it, there have been moments in our lives where although we know that the Lord has called us from some stuff, we have the tendency to return to what God has called us from and we resign our assignment saying, I don't feel like it anymore. You know the Lord gifted you to sing, but somebody got on your nerves in choir rehearsal and you don't sing anymore. You know you're supposed to be ushering on the door with a spirit of hospitality, but because somebody didn't want to sit where you told them to sit, you don't feel like being bothered anymore. You know you're supposed to be in the ministry of the administration, but because you're not the president, you don't feel like being involved anymore. And you have resigned your divine assignment. What made them have a spirit of resignation? What made them have a spirit of resignation? Could it be that they were, they were overly pressured to be Jesus Jr.? And they didn't think they could carry on the ministry like Jesus did? Listen, Jesus has set a high bar. He said, now listen, you've seen me do some stuff, but I'm going to the Father now, and greater works will you do. Maybe they were overly pressured because they didn't think they could handle 
handle the task that was before them. Maybe they had to deal with too many overly critical church folk. You know what he used to do back in the day? I don't know how Jesus going to let him do some stuff. I know his business. I know his history. I know I knew him when he got too many skeletons in his closet for Jesus to be trying to use him. Maybe they said I'm over it because of over pressure from too many people. Maybe they said I'm over it because of overly critical individuals. Maybe they said I'm over it because of overly aggressive police shoot down black bodies in the midst of our streets in these urban cities of ours and maybe they just got so frustrated looking at the contemporary scene in which they live that it just didn't make sense for them to keep on trying to do I told they were locked up for fear that something was going to happen to them if they took out one of us they'll take out the rest of us and could it be that some of the things that we see on CNN, some of the things we see on NBC and ABC and CBS could shut us down and give us a spirit of resignation from the divine assignment. I'm not seeing enough. I'm not seeing enough progress right now. I ain't going no more. I don't see, I don't see enough productivity right now. I'm tired of this. I don't feel like going any longer. And somebody listening to me right now has on an occasion or two or three or twelve felt like resigning from your divine assignment because things didn't go you the way you thought it was going to go circumstances didn't go the way you thought they were going to go maybe you just said it's just not worth it spending too much energy for not enough return making too much investment and I'm just not seeing any benefit from it these brothers have resigned their divine assignment. And maybe I'm talking to somebody tonight and you don't want to say amen or even look amen because you don't want to be guilty. You don't want the preacher to know I'm talking about you. You don't want the people on your pew to know that I'm all down your street right now. And I came to get you on a Tuesday night because somebody in here needs to be restored back to the place where God has assigned you in the first place. says no one who puts his or her hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God how dare you let God bring you this far in your life's journey and now you want to shrink into the shadows and not go any farther how dare you let God bless you the way he's blessed you and you not bless him back how dare you just soak up all his goodness and you not return to him just a bit of what he's been given to you Somebody in this house tonight needs to understand that resignation from your assignment is not an option. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how sick you may have gotten. I don't care how frustrated you may have become. I don't care what your excuse is. Resignation is not an option. Can I push it? Come on, put your seatbelt on. It's going to get tight, but it's going to get right even a little bit. It's gonna get it's gonna get a little bit a little worse before it gets better. But I but since you're here now and you got too much courtesy to leave, you just sit right there and deal with it till I get finished. Yeah. Because first of all, I noticed the resignation of a divine assignment, but then I had to investigate a bit farther, Dr. Smith. Because not only do I see the resignation of the divine assignment of the disciples assignment. But secondly, child of God, I see an interesting picture here of the disciples who are in attendance. Watch, watch. This is very imp impressive, in interesting, not even impressive, but it's intriguing to me. Who's in attendance? You know, you must understand the identification of the disciples in attendance. Identification. The identification. Did you, did you, did you keep your Bible open? I asked you to keep it open in John chapter 21. I asked you to keep your app unlocked. I know it timed out. Just put the code back in there. Let's go through this thing again. The Bible says, the Bible says that the first person who's in attendance is the name we've already mentioned. That's Simon Peter. 
Now you got to check this out. You got to check this out. I'm intrigued by these seven individuals who have now resigned their assignment. The first person is Simon Peter. Simon Peter. I love the fact that John calls him Simon Peter. You must understand that when Jesus called him, his name was Simon. But in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I'm going to change your name to Peter. And Peter means rock. Petros in the Greek. It's a stone, a solid foundation. He says, Simon is your old school name. Simon is your hood name. Simon is your rat name. Simon is the name I called you from. Now I'm going to call you Peter. But when we look at him in chapter 21, he is not just called Peter at this point. He's called Simon Peter because he's not acting like the stone, the rock, the solid foundation that Jesus called him to be. He's acting like the person that God called him to come away from. Have you ever been there? When the Lord called you from some stuff and you went right back to it and you started acting more like your pre-conversion days than your post-conversion days? You don't have to say amen, just look one for me. He's now Simon Peter. If you get into the book of Acts, you will never see the name Simon again because once he gets filled with the Holy Ghost in chapter two, He's a whole new creature. He ain't cussing like he used to. He ain't cutting folks ears off like he used to. He's not denying Jesus like he's used to. He's been filled with the Holy Ghost and he's sold out for Jesus because there is the reality that once you've been redeemed and reclaimed and restored that you will be a whole different person for the glory of God. Is there anybody in here who can testify? I'm not the same person I used to be back in 75. I'm not the same person I used to be in 82. I'm not the same person I was in 97. I'm not the same person I was in 2005. If any man woo, be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All, all things become new. Simon had messed up just a few days earlier. But when Jesus rose from the dead, even though Simon had denied him just a few days earlier, Jesus told those women, Go tell my disciples and Peter to meet me in Galilee. I know he messed up, but I'm a God of restoration. I know he didn't do right, but I'm a God of redemption. Is there anybody in here who is grateful that you serve a God of restoration and redemption? Let the redeemed of the Lord say Look at the identification of the brothers in the text. Not only is it Simon Peter, but the Bible also says that Thomas went fishing. Come on, Thomas, come on, man, just six verses ago, you were overwhelmed that Jesus would show up and he would show you the nails in his hand, nail print in his hand, and the spear print in his side. You were overwhelmed just a few minutes ago. And now you've reverted to a place where the Lord told you not to be. If your Bible is still open, if your app is still unlocked, you'll find out that as soon as they say the name Thomas, then the, in parenthesis, the word Didymus is found. Some of, the, some of your translations already uh, translate the word Didymus to the twin. The twin. We don't know if he had a twin or if he just had a split personality. <laughs> but isn't that a whole lot like you and me? We on again, off again. We one way one day, another way the same day, just a few hours later. Can I get two or three witnesses in here? There's some folk you know, you don't ask them how are you today, you ask them who are you today. If you're sitting next to the person, keep looking straight ahead. Keep looking straight ahead. They won't know we're talking about them. Come on. Is there anybody in here who can testify? If you catch me on the wrong day, I won't be as spiritual as I am when I'm sitting in the sanctuary. If you catch me on the wrong day, I still have some proclivities that I haven't yet gotten past. If you catch me on the wrong day, I might shout hallelujah at 730 and then cuss you out at 930. Come on, let's be honest on a Tuesday. It's just us. Thomas is called the twin and he goes fishing after he was so overwhelmed. Then there's a brother named Nathaniel. 
But they don't tell you just as Nathaniel, but they put intentionally, John says intentionally, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee. You would think that Nathaniel would know some things about Jesus. Why do I say that? Because Jesus decided to begin his miracle working process in Nathaniel's hometown. He started his miracles in Cana of Galilee. Y'all remember? Bible says that when Jesus got ready to start his miracles in John chapter 2 that the first miracle was done at Cana of Galilee when he turned water to wine at the wedding feast. They had run out of wine and Jesus said go fill the water pots up with water and when they did they brought the water to him and when they pulled the water out what was water had then turned to wine and the man at the party said this is the best wine that we've had all day long. Isn't that, isn't that something? Don't you love your Jesus? And he's going to make it the best that it can possibly be. Now, before you get stuck on just water to wine, I need you to understand that when Jesus gets his hand on anything, he'll take the natural and make it supernatural. He'll take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. He'll take what was just bland and simple, and he'll make it profound and amazing. That's what your Jesus does. So don't take credit because you all that now. He just took some old regular person from wherever you came from and he turned your life around and because of Jesus you can testify I am who I am by the grace of God I feel like working tonight can I work a little harder watch this child of God Nathaniel should have been one who always knew what Jesus could do because he started working in his own hometown. He started doing phenomenal things in his residence. And when you've seen the Lord do great things at your residence, in your place of abode, you ought to be so sold out for him that nobody will make you resign your divine assignment. You got, you got, you got Peter, Simon Peter. You got, you, got, you got Thomas, the twin. You got Nathaniel. But then you got the sons of Zebedee. Is that in your Bible? Some of us call them the sons of thunder. That's James and John. James and John are interesting brothers because these were they who wanted some prominence in the kingdom. These were they who came to Jesus and said, listen here, Lord, uh, when you come into your kingdom, let my brother and me, one of us sit on your left hand and the other on your right hand because we want to be the big ballers, shot callers when everybody looks at us. I know you got to leave and all that stuff, but whenever, when you leave the scene we want to make sure that everybody knows we were with that man named Jesus and we got the same power he had. Jesus says, you can't drink the cup I drink with. You can't handle the assignment I got. You better sit yourself down somewhere because if you're going to be the first in the kingdom, you got to be the least in the kingdom. If you're going to be the chiefest in the kingdom, you got to be a servant to somebody. And God deliver us from all these folk in church who are looking for titles and prestige. Jesus said, I want to know if you can serve. Can you serve? Can you serve? Stop trying to get a title. Sit down somewhere and serve. If they never pat you on the back, if they never call your name from the microphone, if they never tell you you did a good job, may I please give you some good news. When you see Jesus face to face, if you've been consistent with your assignment, he'll look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Is there anybody looking to hear Jesus say, well done? I'm almost there now, I'm almost in E-flat. Here it is. He says, listen, stop trying to seek prominence and prestige. I want you to be a servant. And after they were rebuked, a fire was rekindled. But even after the fire was rekindled, they referred it and went fishing. You got, you got, you got Peter out there. You got, you got, you got Thomas out there. You, 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 you got Nathaniel out there. You got James and John out there. And then the Bible says, two other disciples. I like that. I like that. There's no name. We don't know if it was Andrew. We don't know if it was Philip. We don't know if it was Matthew. We don't know if it was Simon the Zealot. We don't know which of the other disciples it was. It was just two guys linking, lingering in the shadows. Because, you know, there's always somebody that wants you to know their name. They're just hanging out in the shadows. 
There's always somebody in the place they know they ain't got no business doing, but don't say nothing about me. They're going to pull that cap down over their face, make sure don't nobody see them, put some shades on their face, because there's always somebody just lurking in the shadows. You know good and well you ain't supposed to be there. You know good and well you ain't supposed to be doing that, but you're hanging out. Don't want nobody to know your name. But the mark of disciple is on you anyhow. And Jesus can see that even those of us who don't have our names called, but we're in a place where we're not supposed to be, who he knows that we are not in the place where he has assigned us. So I guess I need to ask the question before I go to point three. I promise there's going to be some good news. I promise, I promise, I promise. Before I get to point three, I need to ask, which disciple are you? Are you the one who's been reclaimed like Peter, but you reverted? Which disciple are you, child of the God? Uh, are you the one who's been overwhelmed by God's goodness like Thomas, but you reverted? Are you the one who should have remembered what the Lord did in your own house like Nathaniel, but you reverted? Are you the one who got rebuked and then rekindled, but then reverted? Like James and John, are you the one who don't want anybody to know your name, but you're still in a space where you ought not be? Like those two other disciples, you reverted. Which one are you? You don't have to answer out loud, just write it in your notes. Seems bad on the surface. Seems rough on the surface. That these boys, after all that Jesus had done for them, would revert. But keep on reading your Bible. Because in John chapter 21, although these seven men have gone fishing, the Bible says that early in the morning, there's a brother who shows up on the seashore. And when he shows up on the seashore, he hollers out to the fellas on the boat. And he says, friends, have you caught anything? You should already know it's that man named Jesus. And when I get to this third little point, it reminds me of the determination of the dedicated almighty. The determination of the dedicated almighty. Watch Jesus. He shows up. We've identified those old disciples who reverted. We've already seen that they resigned themselves from their assignment. But Jesus is so dedicated, so determined to keep them in the fold that he shows up and he hollers out with a little cynical, ironic tone. Friends, have you caught anything? And they respond to him, no, we haven't caught anything. He already knew they hadn't caught anything. That's why he showed up to prove to them, I called you away from that. And whenever I call you away from that, you will never have productivity. You will never have progress doing that which I called you away from doing. And I need to talk to somebody in here tonight because somebody keeps on trying to inch back to the place where God has pulled you away. And God says you will never find productivity in that which I told you was no longer your assignment. Friends, have you caught anything? No, we ain't caught nothing. It's reminiscent, isn't it, of Luke chapter 5 from last night. When Jesus shows up and says, have you caught anything? They've not caught anything. They're washing their nets. Jesus tells them, go back out there, do it again. And when they do, they get so many fish that their nets begin to break. But in chapter 21 of the Gospel of John, it's not the same story. He says, do me a favor, throw your net on the right side of the boat. And when they threw their net on the right side of the boat, the Bible says they called in, hauled in 153 large fish. But even though they called in 153 large fish, their net never broke. He says, bring them on in. And when that happened, John looked again and he says, that's Jesus. It's the Lord. Because anybody who can make us get this many fish when we know we've been unproductive all night long 
must be the same man who showed up three years ago and did this for us the first time we were out here. And Simon got so happy, he wrapped a little something around his waist, jumped out of the boat, and ran to see Jesus. Other brothers were a little more practical. They just said, we're just 100 yards away. We'll just roll on in to the shore. Read your Bible. You'll read your, if you read your Bible, you'll have a good time in the, in the daytime. Read your Bible sometimes. It's a, it's a, turn Maury Povich off and read your Bible. It'll be a blessing to you. Came on into the shore. Watch this. And when they got to the shore, Jesus had fish grilling on the seashore. I don't know who wouldn't love a Jesus like this. I don't, he restores and then he cooks. I mean, he makes breakfast for you. He, he ceases to just be the savior. Now he's the master chef. He says, this is what you've been trying to do. I, I got this. I can take care of your needs. I can take care of your provisions. I can take care of what you're trying to amass for yourself, but you've got to do it my way. Because if you do it my way, you'll get my results. And is there anybody in church tonight, as I take my seat, who can testify, if you do it the Lord's way, you will get the Lord's results. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly before him. That, that sounds good. Jesus got breakfast on the beach. That's beautiful, isn't it? Breakfast on the beach. I can shout about that. Oh, praise the Lord. Breakfast on the beach. But that's not what got me, Dr. Smith. That's not what got me. What blessed my socks off was the repeated refrain in verses 1, 4, and 14. What blessed me beyond measure is verses 1, 4, and 14. Because verses 1, 4, and 14 say the same thing. That Jesus showed up okay see that doesn't bless you like it blesses me because you have forgotten who he showed up to he showed up to some disobedient rebellious brothers who were doing stuff that he had called them away from and in spite of the fact that he was doing some things that he had called them away from your bible says he still showed up <laughs> and this, this, this blesses me because verse 14 says that it's the third time he showed up to the disciples. Literally suggesting that these fellas are repeat offenders. Come on, man. But even though they're repeat offenders, Jesus showed up. Now that may not bless you because you've been the best saint that there is on your pew. But if there's somebody in this church tonight who's messed up in the same area more than once, it ought to make you put a smile on your face and celebrate the fact that Jesus keeps on making his way into your life to prove to you he has not given up on you, he has not forgotten about you, and he still has work for you to do. And I need two or three people at Covenant United Church of Christ who will go ahead and get happy about the fact that he keeps on hunting me down. He keeps on seeking me out. He keeps on pursuing me. Maybe that's why David says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And is there anybody in church tonight who will help me close this message and celebrate the fact that God keeps coming after you, that God won't let you go, that God won't let you out of his grasp. Somebody in here ought to testify. The reason I came to church tonight was so that I could be challenged over the fact that even though I messed up last week, and messed up last month and messed up last year God says I still have plans for you and those plans are to prosper you and not to harm you to give you hope and a future is there anybody in here on a Tuesday night who can thank God tonight that he never gave up on you he never took his hands off you he never turned his back on you and you're alive tonight to testify can't nobody do me like Jesus can't nobody do me like the Lord I gotta sit down but won't he make a way for you won't he open doors for you won't he provide for you say yeah yes yes <laughs>
Somebody ought to testify. I once was a Peter. I once was Nathaniel. I once was Thomas. But amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. You want to know what happened? He took a nobody from where I was, lifted me to where he wanted me to be, and he keeps on proving that he loves me too much to take his hands off me. That's what happened. It's not that I messed up. It's that he met me with mercy and gave me another chance. That's what happened. Come back tomorrow night. We'll find out what's next.